Hello and welcome to the Artists Make Money podcast, where artists of all flavors bear their souls about money. I'm your host, Vivian Egan. I am an interactive theater and comedy producer, podcaster, and also a freelance business writer. I'm interested in that thorny relationship between money and the arts, and I believe that by talking about it, we can shed some light in some areas that are typically kept pretty hidden. For this very first episode, I'm absolutely delighted to share with you an interview that I did with Magical Bones, a Britain's Got Talent finalist in 2020. We talk about how he's built his unique career as a break dancer slash magician. Yes, that is a real thing. How he taught himself all the skills he needed to get where he is today. How parental expectations have played into his decisions about being a black magician and about his hopes and dreams for the future. I really hope you get a lot out of it. I certainly did. Welcome. Uh, to the Artists Make Money podcast. Um, hello, Magical Bones. Bones, how are you? I'm good, thank you very much. For our listeners who might not know who you are, and I mean, what are they even doing? Could you please introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about what you do? Uh, so my stage name is Magical Bones. I'm a magician. And um, my speciality is incorporating dance and music in my magic acts. Um, And I recently performed on Britain's Got Talent and reached uh, the final of the show. Congratulations. I saw on Facebook. I mean, so last time we hung out, it was backstage at the Edinburgh Fringe and we were both sharing the same venue and, uh, you know, We've, we've both come a long way since then, but I think you've gone like just a little bit further. Uh, so well done. It was really, I watched you on the, on the show and I thought I, I loved watching the judges' reactions. Thank it was you. very cool. I was like, I've seen that show. I've met him. <laughs> it was very cool. Um, what, what impact has it had on your career, um, having been on the final? If I mean... This has been sort of a strange year mm. to sort of make any real sort of assessment of um, the show because the show usually happens in April and it runs for about seven weeks, seven or eight weeks. Mm. And it would have, in normal times, it would have been done by May. And, you know, throughout the rest of the year, you can start reaping the benefits of the show. However, um, in these times, uh, we're in a a very serious pandemic. So um, everything's just sort of all over the place in terms of, especially for um, people in the entertainment industry. Um, So it's kind of, there's no sort of, uh, sort of real way to assess it at the moment Mm -hmm. um, because the show got, um, pushed back the ending of the show sorry the final that got pushed back towards later on in the year so I've had sort of an extended run on television which has been fantastic mm. um, and um, much of the stuff I'm going to reap the benefits for will prob- will be next year which will be 2021 so um, you know I'm doing I'm going to be doing a UK tour cool. um, which is quite exciting um, hopefully by next year when the tour starts uh we'll be out of these um restrictions that we have these... crossed yes um, um yeah so um you were you were already full-time on with your magic before this yeah yeah so but i i did see that you um you've capitalized with some some zoom based magic shows which i think is extremely cool yeah so you know everybody sort of had to transfer transfer their platforms yeah really um and um i think when it when it first started and we we went into lockdown um it was a bit of a scary moment because no one knew like okay you know if you're a stage performer or a singer what how do you make money and, um, you know, 
fortunately, we do have the online um, platforms such as social media. And so I think initially everyone moved to social media or like Instagram and stuff and started mm-hmm. doing like live Instagrams or live everything. Everyone, everything went online. And then people uh, eventually found a way to sort of monetize it by using um, your entertainment to bring value to people yeah. through socially socially distanced methods. And obviously, if you're doing something virtually, it's, you can't be any more socially distanced. So I moved to Zoom for, I, I made it, I created a show specifically for platforms like Zoom, Skype, Google Hangouts, where I could uh, perform my effects and um, still make some money from it. Very cool. Um, so, so going back to like pre-pandemic times, in fact, going back to like right at the start of your career, because you used to be a break dancer professionally first and then you moved into magic. So what was the first like creative thing that you ever got paid for? Um, the first creative thing I got paid for would have been dance. Um, I used to dance on the street, so my background is busking. Oh, cool. Um, so I started out as a street uh, performer. I used to bus uh, in, on the South Bank, just by the London Eye. And initially it just started as just me and some mates, like just hanging about. And we were just dancing, um, you know, training, in fact. We were training and we used to just put a hat out. And um, people watched us train. And because we had a hat out, people started putting money um, just out of their own goodwill. Mm. And that then developed into a street show. And through that, you know, um, I started doing those shows more often. And then, it, and then I started doing competitions, events, and you get noticed eventually by producers or agents. So you get to start auditioning for commercials, music videos, et cetera, et cetera. Mm. So to answer your question, the first time I got paid for something creative was on the streets. Cool. That's, that's awesome. Um, and while you were on that journey of sort of becoming a professional break dancer, what was your shitty like money job that you did on the side or were people just tossing hundreds into the, <laughs> into the hat? Well, when I was, when I was a B-boy, I still lived at home mm-hmm. with my um, parents and um, so I was actually sort of, b-boying was a hobby for me. Mm-hmm. And I sort of d- did that just as a recreational thing. And my goal was to become a, a mathematician. I studied maths in university. And um, oh. I was probably going to become a, te- a maths teacher or something. Yeah. Which is what my parents wanted me to do. Right. So I didn't really have to pay for rent. I didn't really have to pay for... Um, you know, food and stuff because my parents supported me while I was doing my education. Mm. So my side job really was actually b-boying. Cool. That's um, a very cool side job. Yeah. But then when I, to, to say, having said that, when I did get older, um, I think when I was about 22, I started working in Marks and Spencer's uh, as a part-time retail. Uh-huh. And that was a bit long. Um, yeah. <laughs> doing... Um, you know, on tills, being a cashier, sure. that was sort of like, oh, I've got to do this. Um, so I used to do one or, uh, it was two days a week, um, four to nine p.m. in Marvel Arts. Still remember Boston. those hours. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, so that's, that's that was my sort of... Okay, side. so, and that was, was that when you were sort of trying to get into the creative stuff a little bit more seriously? So you're like, I'm going to take this for a bit of financial stability while I invest in my creative career? No, because my creative career, I never ever saw it as the um, option to move forward. I didn't think that, oh, I was going to be a professional B-boy. It was always to, you know, be the mathematician. Yeah. And those jobs I was doing, whether it was Mark Spencer's or B-boy on the side, was just like, oh, just a little bit of money to play around with. Um, like I said, I never had rent to pay for and yeah. I never had um, really any expenses. My dad was very, really worked hard to make sure that 
me and my sisters didn't have to struggle um, in terms of like, you know, we didn't have to struggle. I mean, I, li- I stayed, at, I lived at, with, uh, at my parents till I was about 27, 26. Yeah. So I was lived there for a while. So, <laughs> so it wasn't like I really had any sort of massive income. Sure. So at what point then did you start thinking it more in a more professional way about the creative work? When I sort of disappointed my dad and was like, oh, uh, <laughs> I'm getting a lot of work as a dancer. Yeah. Um, and, you know, I want to pursue this. So mm. I sort of had that conversation with my dad. Um, and I said, look, I just want to pursue my career as a dancer, you know. Um, and that's when he was not too happy about that and sort of mm. was really disappointed. But, you know, you've got to follow your heart. So that's when, I think it was about, I'd say it was about 20, 26, 25, 26, um, when, uh, no, actually probably a bit earlier than that, maybe 24 was when I was getting quite, regular work mm. still not enough to make a full solid living from mm-hmm. I guess however I was still living at home with my parents sure. so the biggest factor in when you're is your rent isn't it yeah. so because that, that wasn't really an issue for me I have I ever lived with a, a well, I was in and out of home from let's say 21 to 27 where sometimes I'd go live with my girlfriend at the time and sometimes I'd stay, come back with my mom. So, <clears throat> and yeah, well, I just never really had the issue of rent um, until I was about 26, so 27. Yeah. It wasn't really a factor. Um, cool. So do you think that that plays a big role in your being able, having been able to invest in that uh, creative path then? I mean, it must have done, right? Yeah, because, you know, as I was an amateur, I was a, sorry, a hobbyist, magician hobbyist from the age of 10. So <clears throat> dancing was seen as my, everyone knows me, as, my nickname's called Bones because I um, was, was a dancer and stuff. So everyone's seen me dancing and doing all the, the stuff on um, b-boy, but my, my sort of side passion was was me as a magician so I love that, this I was like oh I was going to be a mathematician but my side passion was break dancing but then my side side passion was magicianing <laughs> I love it no, but it's, 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 it's kind of it sounds like crazy but like when I was 10 I got a magic set and um you know I started in practicing magic and that was my passion yeah um, but it was a hobby you know, you yeah. know there was no such thing as a black magician yeah. Um, no, no one really saw like magicians as a serious career. It was like, how do you get into that world? So it was just a hobby, messing yeah. around with some friends and you know practicing with other geeky magicians, and um, likewise dance. I think people, everyone has side hobbies. I play chess, for example. I don't see myself becoming a professional chess player. Hey, um, never say never. <laughs> exactly, that's true. <laughs> I'm um, everything else. <laughs> yeah, and you know, I love rollerblading. I love uh, so roller skating. Um, etc cetera, etc cetera. so these are all just things I'm hobbies that I'm a fan of mm. um, magic just happened to be one that I was a serious hobbyist mm. so dancing was my profession but I used to do magic quite a lot just as a serious hobby yeah um, and that's where a lot of my money would go into ah. developing my um, my craft cool um, learn, reading the books yeah. um, buying illusions and stuff and and that's where most of my money was spent. So you're investing, I suppose you weren't consciously thinking of it as investing in that, but like in terms of a career, a future career, or were you? Well, I, I was, I, I guess the, the, the truth is it was when I was about 23, 24 and was getting more professional dance jobs, I, that's probably when I was thinking, mm, this math stuff, I'm not sure about it, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, and that's when I was sort of, thinking of the idea and sort of transitioning professionally anyway mm-hmm. but just not admitting to my parents and almost to myself that okay this is actually what I want to do as the main job yeah um but I was kind of professional anyway so um 
yeah, subconsciously, you're right. I was thinking of mm. you know, things. Um, so I have some questions about like sort of your like emotions about money and stuff, because I find that really interesting in terms of chatting to artists about like uh, how they feel about getting paid and like how they feel about valuing their work and stuff like that. So I have some sort of uh, emotionally questions <laughs> to ask. Um, right, right. Do you have any hang ups about money? Um, that's an interesting question and very broad yeah. uh, at the same time. Uh, so the short answer is sometimes, um, but one of the beauties of performing on the street and meeting so many amazing people is that there's a freedom on the street mm. um, that you get, not with everyone, with some performers that makes you not be afraid of money or not let money control or, uh, or dictate your actions. And this is not with every performer, it's just mm. the performers I've come across. We have this thing of not being dictated by money. Um, so don't let money control you. You, you control money mm. in a sense of like most people would be like, oh, do you know what, I can't do this because of I don't have enough money or I really want to do this, but I can't. So in effect, money controls you. Whereas when you sort of change that sort of thought process and you think, do you know what, I want to do this. Um, and I, I'm sorry, I'd rather I'm going to do this. How, how much money do I need to do this? And how am I going to get the money? You sort of take control of that. And it's just a simple psychological thing, but I've always went with that kind of energy. Um, so my relationship with money is, has been, it's been good. It could always be better, but I feel like I take control of that. Um, I, I try my best to not allow money to take control of me. I think that's amazing. And, you know, when you were talking just now, I was sort of thinking about like, say, mm, I see, I know a lot of people who work in like theater and stuff like that. And the sort of the root the sort of generally accepted route is like maybe you you study a theatre degree or maybe you do it like with the student drama group while you study and then like then maybe you do a grad degree and then you learn how to like apply for arts council funding and stuff like that. And it's kind of like the whole and then, you know, so you have to apply to say have your show be put on in a theater and the whole process is other people making decisions about what you can do like I will let you into this grad program I'll cast you in this play I'll give you this grant and I love the idea of like I'm not going to let it control me I'm just going to do it and I think the sort of yeah the idea of just going I don't need a theater I've, I've got the South Bank. Uh, you know it's actually that's a really important thing you come because it was a sort of way of thinking that I learned quite a long time ago actually and it was a very important part certain things happened in my life that allowed me to think like that um but it's it's actually very very important for us as artists to actually have that thought process because my my journey to where I am now is so unconventional you know yeah. and and it's so interesting hearing what you're saying because I do remember um, you know, like from me saying I wanted to be do my own theatre show, being amongst some of my peers, um, saying oh, I I want to be on I want to be at the Underbelly. I'd love to do a show there, and be at the Underbelly. Um, and I remember people saying to me, so the Underbelly used to have a show in Southbank. Um, they have a festival in Southbank as well. And I remember saying to myself, oh, I want to be in there. I'm dancing on the streets, and. The beauty of the streets is, you know, like I said, there's this thing of like, uh, there's this idea, the thing is, it's like, you can, you make money when you want to make money, essentially. Yeah. You know, I want to make money, I'll stand here, I'll perform, and eventually people are like, pay me for my, um, for my craft. And I just didn't, I just did things really sort of unconventionally in the sense of like, when I, I booked my own, I booked my own um, uh, theatre. So in the sense that I booked my Wandsworth Theatre 
I mm. booked a room there. And um, so I booked, booked it for eight hours and no experience ever doing um, theatre, sound, light, yeah. nothing. Just booked the venue, bought my effects, just told people about it and, and just did it. Yeah. That was my route to theatre. No, no formal experience, no line, no stage manager. Obviously, I, 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 I read one book by... Um, I read a book by a performer. I can't remember the, the name now, but it's mm. uh, How to Produce Your Own Theatre Show. And just did it. So I sort of didn't do the whole process of, you know, arts council, because, you know, you can get all this funding and grants and yeah. the administration of it all. I just went, right, save as much money as I can. It yeah. was to book the room. I even remember the price. It was around... <laughs> Uh, it cost me four hundred pounds at the ones as theatre. Mm -hmm. Really nice room. I've got rid of the ones as theatre now, which is sad. Uh, One hundred and eighty seats, and you get you. I had the room for eight hours, so I had it from four to eleven because you know you need to pack up. You got your get out and all this stuff. So I had enough hours to do that, um, and they just left me to my own devices. And um, the show was uh, was an interesting one because I had no idea what I was doing in terms of stage management. Yeah. But, um, you know, I just did it. And eventually that led me to do a nav one because it sold out. People were so like, oh, my God, you're doing this. You, how brave are you? Like just doing a stage show. Yeah. Um, and, uh, yeah, it led me to do more. And eventually I got... I sent emails out to Underbelly, you know, they weren't replying, sent tons and tons of emails. And eventually someone came to see my show. Do you think of yourself as being good with money? Are you frugal? Do you like to spend big? Um, what are your, what's your perception of yourself? Um, I could be better with money, um, you know, but I am... Um, I don't mind spending big if I feel like it's something that I want to do, like it's worth worthy for me, like whether it's a, an effect or if it's going on a holiday, um, or whatever it is. I'm not, I, tr I try not to be afraid of doing it. I always just, I just, if I want to do it, I'll find a way to do it. So I have a, a, a good relationship with money. I, I, you know, sometimes I do waste money, um, but yeah don't we all <laughs> um you mentioned you mentioned your parents earlier um and how they worked hard to make sure that you didn't have to worry about money what um like what lessons did you learn from them uh, my dad was always about saving you know prioritizing is a, is a key thing in in our careers um in our lives you know you've got to prioritize so you know, sometimes, you know, we, if we look at, if you look through accounts and see how much money you spend, um, a lot of it's wasted on things that don't add value to your life in the long run. Mm. So that's one, one of the key elements my dad would teach me is like, you know, save for important courses, uh, causes, you know, that you want to do, um, whether it's education, whether it's rent. So, I try and make sure the fundamentals are always covered, you know. Mm. That's cool. That's a very good lesson, actually. <laughs> um, so, well, from that, my another question I have is, I'm assuming that you do save for retirement. Yes and no. <laughs> yes and no. Let's hear about it. Because um, there's two schools of thoughts in that. Uh, yes, um, of course, you should save for um, always be saving for whatever important courses. But I think like saving for retirement is sort of a, it depends where you want to retire. I do like to save, of course. Um, and it is important to save, but like, I think it depends where you are in your life mm -hmm. and, and how much of that do you want to save for retirement? Um, because there's so many more things you could be using that money to invest in. Mm. Um, if you have a passion or a dream or um, or things that you could be doing living in the now mm. rather than um, sort of 
saving, putting so much of that into when I retire. And most people's retirements is like, you're talking about your 60s and, you know, 70s or something or 50, mm-hmm. depending on when you want to retire. But mm-hmm. I don't know, there's, I think that the investment in whatever you want to do could be more useful. So I, at this stage in my career, I'd probably put more into investing in whatever it is, you know, is it a holiday? Is it career wise? Is it building a future, you know, for my family, like living the the good moments like now (laughs) and, um, you know, and a small portion of that will go to, you know, retirement, but, you know, sort of kind of live in the moment. So I don't know if it's a contradiction because I like, I live in the moment, but I do, also believe you should, it's important to save for important causes. So yeah. If yeah. retirement is an important cause for you, then, um, then save for it and, you know, plow yeah. all your money into it. Do you invest sort of in something more short term, like, um, you know, stocks and shares or anything like that? I don't. So I'm not an expert in stocks and shares. Um, and I don't believe to invest in what you don't have experience for. Like for me, the reason why I'm, I'm not into stocks and trading and shares, I don't really have a passion for it. And I feel like it's always good to invest in something you fully understand and know. Mm. So the reason why I invested in my career and I've got investments in, in some, some TV stuff, in um, obviously I've invested in my, myself as, a, as an artist. Is because I understand the the, the medium, hmm. so you can explain to me and talk, I can talk to you at length about magic and uh, a little bit about TV. But if you ask me about stocks and shares, I have no idea. <laughs> I don't know about trading, and it's something I'd have to learn that I don't have a real passion for. Like I can't hmm. sleep, uh, wait, uh, stay up all night looking at you know, stocks and shares, like, uh, you know what I mean? So I don't want to invest into something I don't really know. And I think when you invest in something that you're really passionate about and you, you really, it's good psychologically, you're going to study it, you're going to learn more about it mm-hmm. and you're really going to push and that's what will give you the success. What are your financial goals? Um, I'd like to make a an income um, that supports me and my family and my lifestyle and um, means that I don't have to rely on um, my income to, I don't want to just get by. I want there to be such disparity between my Mm -hmm. livelihood and my, the way I live um, and how much money I make that I'm really comfortable. There's no, kind of anxiety that people get so I want a huge disparity (laughs) like that's a cool goal um, yeah do you sort of see yourself as a business owner yeah yeah and when did you start I I mean from from what you've been saying it kind of sounds like you've been a bit like had quite the a business focus from an early point was there like any milestone that you were like right this is like this is my business now this is what I do when I started achieving some of uh, the goals that I'd set out like for example when I did um when I did the, uh, the slight of dance it was called at Wandsworth Theatre the goal was to uh, sell out you know and I sold out both nights um and then, and then when I got into the underbelly, I, it, this was in South Bank, I sold out um, both nights. And that's when I started saying, okay, right, look, there's a level of um, money that can be generated from this. So, you know, this is uh, something I can really um, take forward. Um, and then I started do close-up work as a magician as well. I also work as a close-up magician. And one Christmas, I can't remember it was, a few years ago, I set myself a goal. Um, I set myself a target. And and this is really, I think it's really important to set yourself targets. I set myself a goal of earning X amount of money. Um, And this was in early November 
And I just, I always, when I set, sometimes when I set these goals, I always try and go a little bit higher than what I actually want to achieve. And I hit my benchmark, the, exactly what I set. And that's when I was like, wow, like, I'm a business, like, this can, if you apply yourself and you really focus your mind on one single thing and put energy into that, you can actually achieve that goal. And um, that Christmas, I had so many bookings and I, I, I did it. And I was like, whoa, yes. Um, and so ever since, that's what I always try and do. I set the goal, set the target, and then go for it. That's really great. Um, if money were no object, how would you spend your time? So imagine you've, you've hit like your, you know, that big disparity. You've got like your financial goal has been achieved. What I'd be on the beach. I'm sorry, you know, I'd be on the beach. Right. Me, me and my, my, my missus, we love like just traveling. So one of our biggest things we invest in is traveling. We go, you know, we always travel around the world. We try and find work that allows us to travel. Great. Uh, but we'd probably be somewhere exotic um, and spending good quality family time, going to these shows. Like I think like I love good food, good weather, good locations, and just laughing. So I think investing in just family time and um, yeah, and, and, and just diving into the arts and seeing shows and stuff like that. Oh, that, that sounds like a beautiful way to live. <laughs> <laughs> it's what we try, you know, we work hard yeah. through the year and me and my missus, we, uh, at the moment, we're sort of, we're long distance. So we mm. sort of commute. Our right. relationship with it. She, they're from my my missus and my son are from Canada. Um, um, so sometimes I'll spend a few months in Canada. Sometimes they come and spend a few months here, mm -hmm. and that's how it's going to be. Uh, hopefully next year we'll find we'll settle um, most likely in the UK. Mm. Uh, so for us, going on holiday for a, a you know three or four weeks, um, it's just it's, it's just so desirable. Oh, well, I hope, I mean, I've been through the, like, the partner visa thing here and it's, it's stressful, but it is doable. So you have, you have all my best wishes and good vibes uh, for, for sorting all of that out because it's hard. It's really like, oh, someone else is like making a decision about where I get to live in my life. It's kind of like scary. Um uh is your is your dad like is he mollified is he has he accepted your career now uh he passed away sadly oh, uh, okay. a few years ago yeah um but i think he was at peace i mean i've done some you know like i said for my career as a magician you know when i sit back and look i'm like you know i i'm i'm proud of it i'm pr proud currently you know i yeah. i was an impossible Impossible was the um, the biggest magic show to come to the UK. It was the first show that was in the West End for a hundred years, mm. and um, I was one of the main magicians in the show. Oh, is that the one with the like eleven? We, there's ten. There was uh, six of us, and we were at the Noel Cow Theatre. Ah, and we were there for two years, and then we toured um, uh, the world with the show. So we've been to Dubai, we've been to Beirut. Um, uh, 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 Singapore, um, uh, what do you call it, Malaysia? Uh, yeah, it's been it's been incredible um, doing being one of the magicians in Impossible. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's a dream for most magicians to have been the West End show. Yeah. Um, so, I think when I got into Impossible, I mean, when I did my when I did the show in in Underbelly, my dad was very proud because you know there's 400 people sitting in the audience like, yeah. and he was really cool. But then when I, when I then went on to do um, impossible and I'm in a West End show, I think my dad was sort of like, okay, this is, you know, you've done really well. And he was at peace with it. He was happy for me. That's great. I mean, I'm sure he would just be even prouder today because yeah. you achieved so much cool stuff. Um, final, my final question is, if you had like one piece of advice 
that maybe you wish you'd known or maybe that you'd like to pass on to someone else who's at the start of their career in terms of like being an artist and managing money, what would that be? Um, I think being an artist, uh, I'd give it a piece of advice and this is just from my experience is be fearless, be fearless, be passionate um, and be focused. Because no matter what anyone tells you, um, you know, if you're, if you're fearless and you're passionate about something, you will succeed. And money won't be an object to whatever you are trying to achieve. Um, it just won't. And you just got to come into whatever decision you make or whatever you're doing in your career or your pathway, um, believing that, really believing that. And once you believe something, it becomes part of you and you're able to then go ahead and achieve whatever you want to achieve. Um, and I can talk with confidence from experience and, and, and that's what it is. It's just little baby steps. Um, you can go just take little increments of trying something out, putting all your energy and all your effort into something you're passionate about because that's what's going to help you you know, once you're passionate about something, that's what helps you get along. If it, if it was stocks or shares or, you know, working in some, doing something else with somebody else for ages, you probably wouldn't have the desire to put that extra bit that's going to get you over the line um, into it. But when it's your music or your singing or your acting, you know, you'll do that extra little bit because you're so passionate about it and you're focused and you believe um, money doesn't even come into it, you know. It's just, it just, it's the talent and, and your desire that comes. That's the key. Amazing. So there's my uh, <laughs> words of wisdom. They are very wise. I love them. Um, thank you so much for joining me. This is, I've had such a great time chatting, and thank you for being my very first guest. Thank you for having me. I feel like it's an honor to <laughs> be invited <laughs> on this show, and I'm sure it's going to be. Um, go on to bigger and better things so I look oh. forward to seeing that in the future thank you thank you so much for tuning in to the artists make money podcast you can find us on instagram at artists make money where you can also sign up for our weekly newsletter you can find Magical Bones on Twitter and Facebook and Instagram at Magical Bones. You can find me on Twitter at VivEgan41. If you enjoyed the show, I'd love it if you could rate and review on Apple Podcasts as it really helps to spread the word. The theme music for this show was composed by Tiva. That's T-I-I-V-A. You can check them out on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter and Spotify. Being an artist is hard and making a living from it is even harder. But I believe in you. Keep going.